This lecture is part of an undergraduate course on complex analysis and will be about complex derivatives. Um, I should explain that complex derivatives are absolutely nothing to do with finance or hedge funds and just means differentiation of a complex function. So in order to explain these, we first recall real derivatives or real differentiation. So here we have a function f from the reals to the reals. And what does it mean for f to be differentiable? Well, f is called um, differentiable at x0 in R if f is approximately linear at this point. So let's think what approximately linear means. Well, it means f of x must be equal to f of x0 plus a times x minus x0 plus a small error. Um, so here we see that um, this bit is a linear function. And um, we should really say what we mean by a small error. So um, by saying it's small, we sh should be less than, than any non-zero linear function. Um, more precisely, the error divided by x minus x0 should tend to 0 as x tends to x0. So that's a precise um, meaning of what we mean by, by small error. But we won't worry about the precise meaning too much. You should just think of this informally as being a small error. So all this is saying is that if x0 is this point here and the graph of f looks like this, then the linear term is going to be some sort of linear function like that. And f being differentiable means that f should be rather close to this linear function near that point. Um, there's an alternative way of defining the derivative that you usually come across, which is equivalent to this one. You can define it as the limit as dx tends to zero of df over dx where df is by definition f of x minus f of x zero. D stands for difference. It's, it's the difference of these things. And dx um, uh, is, is, is just x minus x zero. And uh, an incredible amount of confusion has been caused by the fact that mathematicians are lazy and don't bother writing this limit in here and just write df over dx, which looks as if you're dividing something zero by something zero, which doesn't make sense. But um, the, the confusion is caused entirely by laziness of mathematicians who can't be bothered to write in this limit all over the place. So that's what real derivatives are like. Um, now we're going to, well, we're not quite going to look at complex derivatives yet. We're going to look at um, real derivatives of complex functions. So here we're going to take, right, w equals u plus iv um, is going to be a function of z, which equals x plus iy. So um, u and v and x and y are just going to be real variables. Um, so these are both functions of the real variables x and y. So we're going to forget about w and z for a little bit. Um, and what does it mean for this function of two variables to be a function of, to be differentiable as a function of these two variables x and y? Well, we write u and v as a vector, and I'm going to write it as a, as a vertical vector. So we've got this, func this vector valued function u, x, y, v x y and, and we're thinking of it as being a, a vertical vector and we want to say it's approximately linear so it's going to be u x zero y zero v x zero y zero plus some linear function which we're going to write as a matrix of x minus x zero y minus y zero plus an error. And if you compare it with the um, 
real derivative, you see it's just the same. Here we've got f is equal to f of x zero plus some linear, some constant times x minus x zero, except here we're doing everything twice with two, two functions and two variables. So, so, so a gets replaced by a little two by two matrix giving a linear function on R2. And again, this error should be less than any linear function. Uh, more precisely, if we take the error and take its absolute value and divide it by the um, distance from x, y to x0, y0, then this should tend to zero as x, y tends to x0, y0. So again, um, we don't need to worry too much about the exact definition of the error being small. Um, and this bit here is just a linear function. So saying that w is differentiable at the point z, uh, or sorry, at the point z0, just um, means that we can approximate um, this function w by this linear function plus a small error term. And um, this matrix here, we can write in terms of partial derivatives. And if you sort of think about it a bit, the partial derivative, this matrix can just be written as the derivative of u by dx, the derivative of u by dy, uh, the derivative of v by dx, and the derivative of v by dy. So a, b, c, and d just turn out to be these four partial derivatives. Well, um, so far, we haven't really done anything uh, particularly complex. All we've done is discussed um, a, 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 a function from the real plane to the real plane and discussed whether it's differentiable. And we haven't really used the complex structure at all. We've, we've said nothing about complex variables. So this is, th th this, this is what is meant for two for, for, for a, the, the, so, so what we've defined here is just real differentiability of, of functions of, of two variables. And now we've got to discuss what we mean by complex differentiable. So here we've got, a, now, now we want to define a complex derivative. So we recall that w is, was u plus iv and z was x plus iy. And now we want to take the the, the, the fact that we're not working with R2, but we're working with the complex plane into account. So we say W is differentiable as a point of W of Z. So we think of W as the function of Z is equal to WZ0 um, plus A times Z minus Z0 plus a small error. And as usual, we want the error to be um, less than any linear function. I, I'm too feeling too lazy to write it out explicitly. Um, well, let's try and think what a is. Here, a is a complex number. Um, well, if we write everything, we, if we think of z as being two variables x and y, um, then um, we can think of this as being um, x minus x zero and y minus y zero. And we want to think, how does the matrix A act on this? Well, it, sorry, how does A act on this as a matrix? Well, it acts as this matrix here. We have the real part of A, the imaginary part of A, sorry, that should be minus the imaginary part of A, and the imaginary part of A, and the real part of A. And that's just saying that um, um, if we multiply A by x plus i, y, then what we get is this is the real part of A times X minus the imaginary part of A times Y plus I times um, the imaginary part of A times X plus the real part of A times Y. And if you write this in matrix form, it turns out to be this matrix here. Um, now, if we compare this to the formula we had on the previous sheet, we see that this matrix is also um, given by du by dx, uh, du by dy, uh, dv by dx, and dv by dy. So now we see that um, in order for, for w to be differentiable as a complex 
um, function, we must have this equality here. So, so this is the condition for w to be differentiable as a complex function, given that it's differentiable as, 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 a, as, a, as a real function. So let's see what this says. Well, um, it just says the real part of a is equal to du by dx is equal to dv by dy. And it says the imaginary part of a is equal to um, um, dv by dx, which is equal to minus du by dy. So the condition for a to exist consists of these equations here. And these are called the Cauchy-Riemann equations, named after Cauchy and Riemann, who were the two founders of um, complex analysis. So, so this is the um, necessary and sufficient condition for um, a real differentiable function to be complex differentiable. Um, uh, we, we can also write a as we, we, we uh, in, in terms of taking a limit, we find that a is equal to the limit of dz tends to zero. So dz tends to z. Yeah, sorry, dz tends to zero of um, w dw over dz, where dz uh, where, where where, D, uh, where, where, where dz is equal to z minus c0 and dw is equal to wz minus wz0. So um, the, the derivative of a complex variable can be defined in much the same way as, as, as real variables by use of a limit. Um, notice, by the way, that, that, that um, when we're doing the derivative of two real functions of two variables, we can't really define it as a quotient um, because you can't really defi define the quotient of an element of the plane by an element of the plane. So this, this wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for, for, for two real variables. Um, so, um, um, and, and suppose that, um, W is some complex function of Z for Z in some open set U of the complex plane. Then W is called holomorphic if um, it has um, a complex derivative everywhere. on u. And that means in particular it has to be continuous and have the real derivatives and the real derivatives have to satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And this word holomorphic um, is probably the holomorphic functions are the single um, most important concept in complex analysis. In fact the whole of complex analysis is in this course will be little more than um, discussing the special properties of holomorphic functions. Um, the, the, the reason for the name holomorphic is a little bit mysterious. So hollow means whole or entire and morphic means shape or form. So holomorphic means whole shape or whole form. And I've no idea why this was used to mean um, a differentiable complex function. Um, I, I, maybe someone just liked obscure Greek words or something. Um, you'll sometimes see the word analytic used instead. So um, analytic, um, strictly speaking, has a slightly different meaning. It means it um, has a power series expansion at each point. And what we will do is we will prove later that for complex functions, they're holomorphic on an open region if and only if they have a convergent power series expansion at every point. Um, the, the concept, so, so for complex functions, holomorphic and analytic are more or less equivalent. Um, analytic is 
applies to somewhat more general classes of functions. For example, if you've got a real function of a real variable, you can call it analytic if it has a convergent power series expansion at every point, but you couldn't call it holomorphic. So there's a slight difference between these terms, but um, we don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, there's another way of writing the Cauchy-Riemann equations. What we're going to do is we're going to define the partial derivative with respect to z and the partial derivative with respect to the complex conjugate z bar. So we, the, these are called Wertinger derivatives. And their definition is as follows. So the partial derivative with respect to z is just a half delta by delta x minus i delta by delta y and d by dz bar is defined to be a half of delta over delta x plus i delta over delta y. And when you look at these, you think, what the heck is going on here? Um, first of all, we've got this weird factor of two for no reason at all. And secondly, we've got a minus i there when we really ought to have a plus i because we've got a z which is x plus i, y, and so on. So why is that a minus i? Um, and the reason for these funny definitions is the following that d by dz of z is equal to 1, d by dz of z bar is equal to 0, and d by dz bar of z is equal to 0, and d by dz of z bar of z bar is equal to 1. So we choose these funny linear combinations of x and y because they give these results, which um, are what we would expect um, differentiation with respect to z and z bar. Notice that this does not mean we're taking the limit of, um, I mean, if we're taking df over del dz, it doesn't necessarily mean we're taking the um, difference in f divided by the difference in z as z bar remains as, as, as z bar remains constant, because if z bar remains constant, then z also remains constant because they're complex conjugates. So these derivatives shouldn't be, whoops, sorry, that should be a z bar there. So these derivatives shouldn't be taken um, too seriously. They're just sort of formal definitions which happen to work like this. So what is the point of these definitions? Well, one point is we can write the Cauchy-Riemann equations which you remember were du by dx equals dv by dy, and du over dy equals minus dv over dx. These turn out to be equivalent to just saying that dw by dz bar is equal to zero. So you remember w is equal to u plus iv, and z is equal to x plus iy, and z bar is x minus i y. So, so, um, th 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 so this gives um, a very suggestive form of the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Informally, holomorphic means it uh, depends on z but not z bar. Well, of course, that doesn't make sense because z bar is just the complex conjugate of z. So something can't really depend on z without also depending on z bar. Um, so this is really meaningless. But it's still a kind of useful way of thinking about holomorphic functions. And there, 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 there are some ways in which you, you can make sense of it, as, as we'll get to in a moment. Um, but before doing that, let, let's have some actual examples of holomorphic functions. Um, so first of all, I'm going to give the, the more or less obvious examples. So um, obvious examples are 1 and z. Well, these are both linear. So they're certainly, they're linear in z, so they're certainly holomorphic. Other examples, suppose f and g are holomorphic on some open set u in the complex numbers. Then um, f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and f divided by g are also holomorphic. And so is um, the composition f and g. So these are all holomorphic. And the proof of these is easy. You just take the usual proof of this in calculus or real analysis and just copy it for complex variables. And I'm not going to bother writing that out in detail. 
if we've got a power series A0 plus A1z plus A2z squared, which converges for, say, z less than some constant, then it's holomorphic and its derivative is what you would expect. It's A1 plus 2A2z and so on. And again, the proof of this is very similar to the proof you get in a real analysis course, except you do complex variables rather than real ones. So again, I'm not going to bother with it. Um, this means that all these things like sine, cosine, tan, exp, log are all differentiable, at least where they're defined. I mean, this has some points where it's infinite, where it's obviously not differentiable. And you remember there was a bit of a problem defining log, but if you can define it, then it's differentiable. And um, we get all sorts of things like Leibniz's rule tells you what the derivative of f times g is. So, so pretty much everything you learnt about differentiation, or at least the formal properties of it in calculus, also apply to complex derivatives. OK, so these are the obvious examples. There's a surprise non-obvious example. Well, it's not a surprise if you were paying attention during the first lecture, but the surprise is that df over dz is holomorphic if f is. And the reason this is a surprise is it's totally false for real variables. You can have a, a function of a real variable that's um, differentiable everywhere. For example, you can have a function that looks like um, 0 for x less than 0 and x squared for x greater than 0. And its derivative then looks that, that is certainly not differentiable at 0. Um, so this is the one unexpected thing. Um, we're not going to prove this yet because proving this requires some extra ideas that we haven't yet actually covered. Um, well, there's a lot of functions that are differentiable. So roughly speaking, any reasonable function of z is differentiable or holomorphic. So here are some examples that are not holomorphic. Um, the real part of z is not. The imaginary part of z is not. Um, the absolute value of z isn't, the absolute value of z squared isn't, I mean, the absolute value of z isn't even real differentiable at naught, but squaring it is no good, it's still non-holomorphic, and you can see that's because it's sort of got a z in there. And finally, the complex conjugate of z is also not holomorphic. And you can check that these are non-holomorphic very easily just by looking at Cauchy-Riemann. For example, here, the function u is equal to x and v is equal to zero. So delta u over delta x is not equal to delta v over delta y. And therefore this isn't holomorphic and the others are non-holomorphic for um, very similar reasons. Um, so, um, so we can ask um, a question um, which polynomials in x and y are holomorphic. Well, um, instead of writing them as polynomials in x and y, we can write, um, we can instead ask which polynomials in z equals x plus iy and z bar equals x minus iy are holomorphic. So this, this is just a sort of change of variable. Any polynomial in x and y can be written, written as a polynomial in these two variables here. So we might take it to be sum of a, m, n, z to the m, z bar to the n. And we ask, when is this holomorphic? Well, you remember, all we have to do to check whether it's holomorphic is to apply the operator d by dz bar. And this applies this is additive and satisfies Leibniz's rule. So this becomes sum over a, a m n of z to the m times n z bar to the n minus one. And this has to be zero. And now you see this implies a m n times n is equal to zero for all m and n. And this is only possible um, if a m n is equal to zero, if n is greater than zero. So 
our function f of x, y is equal to sum over a m zero of z to the m. In other words, it's a polynomial in z. And this is an example of what I said earlier about holomorphic functions are those that depend on z but not on z bar. And as I said, that wasn't really a terribly meaningful statement, but that's sort of what's going on here. If, if you write a function as a polynomial in z and z bar, then the holomorphic functions are indeed the ones that depend only on z but not on z bar. Um, something similar to this is true if, if you write these functions as, as infinite convergent power series. Um, so if you want to see the, the um, holomorphic polynomials, you just take the real and imaginary parts of powers of z. So we get 1 x y x squared minus y squared 2 x y um, and so on. Um, so um, what we'll be talking about next lecture are a special property of the real parts of holomorphic functions, which is they turn out to be things called harmonic functions. So next lecture will be about harmonic functions and their relation to holomorphic functions.